Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Donna Mejia, who is an associate professor, former director of graduate studies in dance and the Crown Institute inaugural chancellor's health and wellness scholar in residence at the University of Colorado Boulder. Donna, welcome to the show. Hello, Erin, thank you very, very much for the invitation. Oh, it's so you. great. I am so excited to be able to talk to you about the work that uh, that you do uh, and encapsulated by many, many uh, titles and descriptions um, because your work really is, uh, is I think, um, profound and important and in some ways um, unique. Um, and so I really want to kind of talk about all of these. Uh, this show is co-curated with CU Boulder, uh, one of our wonderful partners at Arts Engine, so which we're so excited about. Um, so why don't we kind of delve right in. One of the things um, that you are is you are a professor of transcultural fusion, and I believe actually the first professor of transcultural fusion globally. Why don't we just start there and just share with us what is that for our audience? What does that mean? Thank you, good question. Transcultural fusion dance is a fusion form. It's a mashup form that blends North African and dances of the Arab world with hip hop and electronica. So it's definitely an emerging form uh, that really blossomed with the, the global musics that came out of the electronica industry where people started um, digitally manipulating traditional instruments and then mashing them up with hip hop beats and finding out how it would come out. Now, even though I'm a first generation professor of the form, I consider myself a fifth generation artist. I am definitely not the first in the form. And so I really wanna give tribute to all of the artists that created a global community of practitioners. I just happen to be right place, right time. Um, and the right feisty person maybe to take it into academia and we'll see how how much wide we can open the gateway for others to do it as well so and i really want to talk about that too because this work that you do is so important and there are certain academic settings where sometimes it's tough to do work that's really bringing about significant change. So I wanna talk about that and bringing a feisty attitude uh, to that type of work and kind of how it gets done. But before that, I wanna talk about kind of just the work itself. Uh, curious from your perspective, when we think about the issues like privilege, um, hidden bias, social mm -hmm. justice across the board, um, how do the art, how do you see the arts fitting into that, especially in an academic setting? What, what can we and or should we be doing in the arts bringing towards that, especially with the mind that there's certainly a lot of academic settings that are like, okay, the art, this is just, we're just gonna train this craft the way that it was you know, trained or taught 50 years ago, 100 years ago. So just curious how you think about that. Oh, such a brilliant question. I think of the arts as really the um, canary in the coal mine. I think of the arts and the way it's generated within the people of the people, and especially because I'm a mover, the vernacular movement of the people as being the way uh, we start to see transformations in consciousness and new trends and new cultural values being expressed through their bodies. And then they make them into the philosophical realm and into the religious realm and into the political realm and into policy realm. But the scaling of it usually starts from um, really what is originating within the people of any geographic area. And so for me, uh, the arts are a barometer for the cultural, the cultural consciousness of a people, to be honest with you, how they relate to each other in terms of their gender roles, um, their socioeconomic status in a community, uh, their political importance, 
um, ways of expressing and normalizing behaviors between each other, all of that comes through how we use our bodies and how we communicate. So for me, the expressive arts, music, dance, theater, all of those things, um, even visual arts are a barometer for what's happening within the consciousness of the people. Oh, and I really, I love that. That is definitely sticking with me that the art serve is this barometer of our cultural conscience, consciousness, that uh, absolutely. So for those, a number of, you know, people watching our show are, are involved, they're in academic settings or other institutional settings. Mm -hmm. And I think, of course, a lot of them hear that and are like, oh my gosh, like, yes, yes, I, I want to be doing this work. Um, but it's either not happening at my institution or I'm mm -hmm. not sure how to how to get started. So I'm I'm curious kind of on that that functional level. Is it is it looking at, you know, okay, I've just got to try and create this class or do this? Is it relating to how we do performances? What kind of um, kind of structural advice or guidance would you have for anyone watching who says, I want to do more of this work or see more of this work done at my institution? Uh, I recommend that first all institutions, it would make me so happy to see all institutions really looking at the canon that we teach and trying to um, shake up and disrupt the canon, not to uh, devalue any part of the canon, but to say we can rotate parts of the canon in and out of the curriculum rather than treat it as a must do every single time. And somewhere within the arc of a student's education, we start to see that that well-roundedness serves them in dimensionalizing their understanding of their craft. And so I think also what we have learned from the COVID pandemic is that Zoom and all kinds of video conference capacities allow us to visit with artists all over the world. I mean, the only obstruction we have is time zone differences. And I know, for example, in a few weeks, I have artists from um, Paris and Tunisia and Morocco zooming in to visit with some of my students. And um, bless their hearts, they have to wake up at like two or three in the morning in order to make class time. But once in a while, they're willing to do that because for them, it's an important conversation. They've not had their voices represented in the canon of what we offer in American universities. And so I feel that integration happens with, first of all, opening up the canon. Next, um, inviting in the voices of source material artists um, rather than speaking on their behalf. I think that's the problem with traditional anthropology in the past and musicology is that you would have experts who go out and study and then summarize and speak on behalf of artists. And I think we need to uh, challenge ourselves on that kind of agency that we've given ourselves as academics. Oh, I absolutely love that. And I think you're absolutely right. With, while we have the unbelievable and overwhelming tragedy of COVID and the pandemic, it has advanced use of a technology that already existed, but that as institutions, I think we're often very resistant towards. But now it can literally enable some of this direct connective work that previously would have been very difficult and sometimes impossible budgeting, trying to, you know, physically fly people around. And now we can really connect them directly. Love that. Exactly. Yeah. And it also, I think, reconnects us with our humanity and a sense of community. Um, even though it's through a digital medium. The truth is to have conversations with people that we would not encounter on a daily basis in our geographic proximity, to me, is wondrous. And so it reminds us that we are global citizens. And for me, that's the litmus test of where we're heading is everything that we're teaching. If we're not creating better global citizens, then we are um, impoverishing our students for the complex world that they are about to inherit. Wow. Absolutely. So one additional question we mentioned about kind of, you know, feisty personality and all of that. What brought to my mind this extraordinary work that you're doing is there's maybe one or two academic settings that I've encountered in my life where there's sometimes resistance that occurs um, to anything that is different. It's not sometimes not even focused on not even liking the change, just any change there's resistance to sometimes. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious yeah. kind of what suggestions would you have if we had someone out there in our audience who was like, okay, I've got it. And I think there are some, some of these things we might be able to do to move this work forward, but I either fear 
the resistance and I'm maybe not in a particular role where where I'm susceptible to to others, you know, negative influence affecting my professional trajectory. Um, and and I may have fear associated with with being able to move some work forward and or I just um, I don't see the work happening. I feel like I can't make it happen. Any suggestions that you might have? Start with a support network of your peeps. People you can call upon that will keep you remembering why you fell in love with the art in the first place, right? Your inspiration network. Um, I fall back on my inspiration network frequently. And I think when you are creating such radical reimaginings of an environment that is very established, I think so much of it comes from starting with inspiration of saying, before you, um, you maybe resist this idea. Can I show it to you first? Can I show you the magic? Can you see the astonishing thing that I'm talking about? And after you've had an opportunity to let people see this jaw-dropping art for themselves, they're frequently leaning in and saying, how do they do that? What's involved? How long have they been studying? How do you train for this kind of thing? And um, I think if they still have any sense of wonder left in them, you start by tapping wonder and then you let curiosity start to open doorways rather than feeling like you have to bang on the door when you are not welcomed. I mean, I honestly myself have chosen to follow a path of least resistance. I go where the work will not be obstructed um, because I know that my feistiness can lead to me being, you know, not the best team player under those circumstances, right? <laughs> and so in order to- We've all to, been there, we've all been there. Yeah, in order to, to start a conversation, I lean on a sense of wonder and inspiration and then go from there because we all have rearranged our lives, our pocketbooks, our educations, our priorities for the art that we do and to help someone be reminded of that original inspiration is I think is a gift, even if they don't convert to what I'm interested in. Yeah. It's just acknowledging that our original inspirations are profound. Yeah, I love that. And I love tapping into an inspiration network. I often talk about that network you build around yourself, but having a specific inspiration network and then also being able to show the work I love that because you're right sometimes some people they don't realize and they might otherwise be resistant but then if they just catch a glimpse and actually experience what you're talking about, oh I didn't realize this and then you really and you create allies so yeah, absolutely wonderful, amazing work. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time, um, but I always like to kind of ask, you know, the, the, this type of work, while so inspirational, there's gotta be some tough days and, and challenging days. And in those times, where do you uh, draw on? Is it the Inspiration Network or is there anything else that you draw on for strength, for, for courage um, during the toughest of times? I have been a meditator for about 40 years and that um, the inner landscape continues to be a place where I find truth bubbling up. And so taking the time to listen to that truth is important to me. And in that, for me as a dancer, the body is a contributor to how I encounter, inhabit and respond to the world. And so taking enough time to sense what am I feeling? How's my body doing? Where is this registering? All of those things uh, are part and parcel of how I do the work. And I'm so grateful for that knowledge. I wish so many folks would discover the magic of this intrinsic wisdom we have in the body before a midlife crisis, before a health crisis, but to say, ah, oh, I've got this instrument that I'm in all day. Let me figure this thing out. <laughs> I would hope that for people. That is my inspiration within. And it helps me to also lean on the inspiration web around me. Thank you for that question. That was a good one. 
Dana Mejia, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Deeply honored. Thank you so much. Thank you.